happens when you lose your job late in your career? Over the years, we've met many retirees who didn't choose to retire early, but instead unexpectedly lost their job after the age of 50. This can be a really scary time to lose your employment, especially if you've worked for a company for a long time and given that company your loyalty. Your identity may be wrapped up in that job and it can be hard to land on your feet after something like that. Finding a new job can be challenging as there is no doubt that ageism exists in the workplace here in America. However, all is not lost because there has never been a better time to become self-employed. And that's why I invited my friend and business coach, David Schreiner Khan, onto our YouTube channel to tell you about how he turned a devastating career loss into a lucrative and fulfilling self-employment and how other folks age 50 plus are doing the same. David has a very successful podcast called Smashing the Plateau in which he interviews entrepreneurs like myself about what it takes to run a successful small business. However, his new podcast is the one I'm most excited about for our audience here on the Boomer Benefits YouTube channel. In his new Going Solo podcast, David explores how sometimes a late career job loss can turn into the best thing that ever happened to you. He interviews amazing baby boomers and seniors who have found themselves suddenly unemployed and who took the bull by the horns and turned that job loss into the most exciting jobs of their lives working for themselves. Please join me for this interesting interview with my friend, David schreiner Khan. Hello, David. Thank you so much for joining us on the Boomer Benefits YouTube channel today. Thanks so much, Danielle. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. I love to bring this type of content to our audience. We do lots of stuff about Medicare, but Medicare is a pretty boring topic. So we like to bring in other experts who have a similar audience who can, you know, add something a little spicier to the channel. And I've had an opportunity to listen to your new podcast. I think it's fabulous. And I love the subject matter because certainly I have had in my own family, people who have experienced ageism in the workplace and then you know, found themselves after 60 looking for a new career. So why do you think that ageism for people over 50 in the workplace exists today? Um, I think it's part of our culture, particularly the American culture. I mean, there, there are cultures in the world where the elderly are really revered. Yes. I hate to say it, but I don't think that's true in America. I think there's a lot of prejudice against older people. You look at, at where marketing dollars get spent. It's, what is it, like the 18 to 34-year-old age cohort? Yeah. People don't think about spending money on um, the 60-plus age cohort, even though 60-plus, they may actually have more money. Yeah, you know, so I, that's a, such a good point. And it really is that way because I know uh, I've read about like we have long term care here in the United States and I've read about other countries like Japan, where it would just be unheard of that your aging parent wouldn't live with you forever. And so we do kind of fly the coop and separate ourselves today. And, and it's unfortunate that as we get older, with the changing pace of technology that employers just tend to think that if they hire an older employee or they have an older employee in a position that they're not gonna be able to keep up as well. And certainly something that's worth all of us working to change. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, um, so when someone experiences a late career job loss, can you walk us through some of the emotions that it's normal, normal for them to experience? Yeah, so one um, big one that happens right away is trauma. There is actually, you, you are facing a loss. I've had people who have said to me, um, I don't know what to put on my LinkedIn profile. Like, like day one, like you, you walk into your office, like assuming, let's say you have a, an office job. I mean, not every job is that kind of job, but let's say you have an office job, you walk into your office, you have a normal day on Friday, everything seems fine. You go in Monday morning and instead of walking to your desk, security greets you at the door. And say, Can you give me your, your company cell phone, your company laptop and your keys? And they tell you to turn around and go home. Yeah. I mean, right. Especially if you're somebody who has been in the workforce for 20 to 30 years, you may have been in your particular job for a long time. Yeah. So, and right. So our whole, our whole ego is so tied to what we do in our work. One of the first things somebody that you don't know might ask you when you meet them is, Oh, Danielle, what do you do? And right. Yes. And the whole idea is like, like, what's your job? What's your work? And so you, your answer is usually, well, I'm, um, I'm an engineer with Exxon, or I am an accountant with Deloitte, or um, 
you know, et cetera. So, you, and even if you're working in a, in your own business or you have, or you're working for a small business, you're still, your, your association is going to be with, um, what you would put on your LinkedIn profile or on your resume. And then all of a sudden you can't say that anymore. Yeah. So, so there's, there's this huge um, hit to the ego. You're, you're, you're scared because uh, particularly if you're in the second and a half of your career, you're probably at a point in your life where your expenses are pre like without making a drastic change in your lifestyle, your expenses are going to be pretty fixed. And they may be higher than they've ever been before. Yeah. Um, especially like if you have a family and you have kids, you may have kids in college. Mm -hmm. um, we know how much that costs. So it, like it's, it's really scary. Then the other thing that happens in terms of the emotions is shame. Mm. Um, even though for most people when this happens, it's not about their performance. It's usually yeah. due to other reasons. There's um, the company was, was acquired. And the acquiring company wants to show that they're um, they're feeding the bottom line. How do they do that? They cut the most expensive workers. Of course, that's, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, sometimes it's a change in the marketplace. Um, the, the first company, the first time I got fired when I was in my twenties, the company that I worked for lost about half of its business, and wow. and they they had to they just couldn't meet payroll, so they had to fire like a huge portion of the staff. Yeah. Um, and in my case, had nothing at all to do with my performance. It was a, a month after I got a great performance review and a big raise. So these kinds of things happen and they happen to older workers as much as they happen to younger workers. It's just, I, I think emotionally, it can be a lot more devastating to people mm -hmm. who are older because there seems like there's so much more at stake. There's so much more um, that you're afraid you're going to lose that you've already built up in your life. Yeah. So, so sh shame, fear, trauma. Um, yeah, the, the emotions are, are pretty big. I can see that. And I also think too, especially in the baby boomer generation, it's such a loyal generation. And you, you do still meet people who've put in, like you said, 20 or 30 years with the same company, and their job is all wrapped up in their identity. And so they almost can go through experiencing grief as well, just uh, grieving the loss of the way that they saw themselves. Yes, um, it is definitely a grieving process. Yeah. So what are some of the best steps that someone can take immediately if their employer notifies them that they're losing or maybe losing their job? Are there some do's and don'ts? Um, well, if you've, if you've been notified that you've lost your job and you're, you're out the door and you're no longer working, um, it's a little different than if you think you might be losing your job. Okay. One of the thing, one of the things that I tell clients all the time, no matter what stage in life you are, and whether you're an employee or you're an entrepreneur, you always need to have a plan B, and mm. not only one plan B, you need to always be scenario planning. And one of the, um, I, I would say, the um, uh, a myth about working for someone and getting a paycheck is that there's some security because you're getting you're getting steady income. Yes. And the, rea the reality is that as an employee, there's actually a lot. I think there's a lot more risk than when you're an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. because as an employee, um, for many people, a hundred percent of your income is coming from one source, and if that yeah. source disappears, you go from a hundred percent to zero. That's super devastating. If you have a business. And you lose, even if you lose a big client, chances are that big client is not all of your income. Yeah. So you have other stuff you can fall back on. And, and as an entrepreneur, you may have been thinking that there's, you know, there's some other area I want to try to launch something new or try to mm -hmm. sell something new. And I just haven't had time to do it. Well, all of a sudden your big client is gone. You can ramp up that trying to sell something new. Yeah. As, as an employee, um, you have to like start from scratch yeah. with developing relationships and trying to convince somebody that you can provide value for them, that they're going to pay you, um, especially for people who are mid-career and later, they're going to be paying you probably a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that's really a good point that I've never thought of before because I do 
I get a question a lot here working in the Medicare insurance industry with all the political stuff going on. People will ask, well, what happens if Medicare for all kills your business? And I never worry about that. It doesn't concern me in the least because I think I know so much about marketing and I know so much about online sales and I will just go sell something else or I'll work to sell life insurance. And so when you are an entrepreneur and you've already accomplished one business, you have the confidence that you might be able to go and start something else. Whereas if you are an employee and you've never been in that role before, the first time is certainly the scariest. You know, I remember the early days and, and how that was scary. Um, so, and that was, you know, and I hadn't been in that job that I left for 20 years. So a lot of people that are in the, their 60s or over even over age 50 today, when they lose a job, if they've never had a business before, it's a whole new ball game. Right. So, so you know, in terms of do's and don'ts, particularly if you are late career and you are thinking that your next step after losing a job is to be an entrepreneur and you've never done it before, then um, one piece of advice I offer is to find a way to actually take a pause. Mm -hmm. um, take, some, take some, quote unquote, some time off. Give yourself permission to take time off because you have been doing something for a long time. You actually need space to kind of, um, kind of regroup in your mind. You need space to go through that grieving process because of the loss of your job. You are not going to be seeing the people who are, you know, you have probably have good relationships with that you were seeing every day at work. Yeah. Um, that's another kind of loss. So, so you need, you need space to kind of deal with the loss and you need space to think clearly about what your next steps are going to be and how you're actually going to get something new off the ground. Um, and if you have the financial wherewithal to take a pause for even a month, um, you'll be so much better off. Uh, one, of, um, one of my guests on Going Solo uh, talked about taking a year off because he had the financial wherewithal to be able to do it. And um, he talked about how helpful that was because he really ha he had never run his own business before, even though he was a very successful uh, uh, corporate executive. And so having that space is really important. And if you can't financially manage taking the space off and taking the time off and having that mental space, one thing you could think about doing is maybe you could get a, an interim job that might be at your pay grade. It might not be doing exactly what you um, find most satisfying, but it will give you space to just breathe and think and relax a little bit and at least bring in some income to manage some of your expenses. Yeah. So I would say take sp space is the most important thing right away if you can do it. Second thing is um, get some help to deal with the emotional fallout. Mm. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, th there's, um, you know, you, you're in the, essentially in the health and wellness field. And there's a lot of stigma in America and particularly around mental health issues. And I think it's even stronger for baby boomers than it may be for younger people. If you've never seen a therapist before, this might be a time to start doing it. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you do see a therapist regularly, make sure you ask for some help dealing with some of the emotional fallout. It's, um, it's okay. We, you yeah. know, our emotional health is as important as our physical health. So, so help is really important. And the second kind of help that you should think about getting is, especially if you're planning to start a business, you are going to need a whole new skill set that you, um, some of which you may have and a lot of which you may not have. So think about who might be in a position to help you. And um, mm -hmm. uh, like when, when I started my business, uh, I was an employee for 28 years and I started my business uh, I'd never run a business before. There were a few people who were really instrumental. There was one mentor who I would meet with about once a month. We'd have lunch. And uh, he was a great resource to talk to about what I was going through and also was able to make some great referrals to me because he was in, we were in the same sector. And he was somebody who um, was a professor and, uh, and had did, did some consulting in addition to that. So he kind of knew what I was going through. He had seen a lot of students go through it. 
Um, so that was like super helpful to me. So I think finding somebody or multiple people who can provide some kind of guidance, either as uh, mentors, uh, if you can afford it, it's once, especially once you figure out what it is you actually want to do and how you want to start it, getting some coaching help can be really instrumental because coaching, the whole idea about coaching is a coach should be able to help you do what you want to say you do because that coach has actually mastered it. If you think about people who get um, like a tennis coach or a piano coach, they want to learn from somebody who knows how, knows the technique and knows how to do it and is going to help them get there faster and avoid mistakes. So a good coach can help you avoid costly mistakes, can help you ramp up your income faster, and can also ask you some tough questions if, um, if it's not clear that you're going down the right path for the right reasons. Um, so paid help is good too. Just, you know, think of, be judicious about what you can afford. And, um, and there are a lot of people out there offering all kinds of help at all different price ranges. So do your, you know, due diligence in terms of deciding who you want to work with and how. Um, the third kind, third place for help, which I personally found very powerful, is being in some kind of group with peers. Like we're, we're, um, uh, spending time with like-minded people mm -hmm. is really important. I remember when I interviewed John Lee Dumas on my show, who was a very well-known podcaster, one of the things he said was when I, uh, when I left the military, actually, no, he left the military, he started law school, then he quit law school to start a seven day a week podcast. And everybody around him <laughs> thought he was crazy. <laughs> and, and he said, what, what kept him going was he joined a group, of people who were entrepreneurs who would meet regularly and talk about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So if you want to become an entrepreneur, if you're spending your time hanging around employees, that's probably not going to help you become a good entrepreneur. You need to be with entrepreneurs. And uh, yeah, so peer, peer support groups, whether they're formal and structured and paid um, or voluntary and unpaid, just be with like-minded people be with like-minded people on a consistent basis in a uh, in a safe space where you f feel you can open up about what's really scaring you because they will help you. Mm -hmm. And you have so much more opportunity to do that today. You know, you can find groups like that even on Facebook where you can search for people in a similar situation or if you know someone else that has lost their job and you can start your own little support group. There's a lot of ways to make that happen in the digital age that we didn't have before. And one of the things I think is so powerful about your podcast and what you're sharing is that you yourself has, have gone through this. You're not looking at it from the outside. So can you um, tell the audience kind of what happened with you when you had lost your job and then when you decided to go into business for yourself, was that a new idea or is it something that you had already kind of always been thinking about in the back of your mind? Um, yeah, so I had actually been thinking about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, um, I mentioned getting, you know, losing my job when I was in my 20s. And at that point, I had thought about it, but I just, I didn't know any entrepreneurs. I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I, I tried a little bit, but didn't get very far and it ended up, ended up getting another job. It was way easier at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, you know, as I got older, I knew many more people who were entrepreneurs and I really um, had reached a point in my career where I wanted more control over my destiny. And, and I thought long and hard, I was at a kind of a crossroads where I could have moved up the ladder in my field um, and, and um, moved to a, uh, a more responsible position with more compensation or I could have gone out on my own. And I decided um, that if I was gonna make, make a move, uh, whether it was voluntary or involuntary, I was gonna go for entrepreneurship, which was, uh, which was quite scary. It was a point in my life when my family had a lot of expenses um, and uh, not that many people make that transition. Uh, particularly, I, you know, I made the transition 13 years ago. I think it was less common than it is today. Yeah, I would agree uh, with that. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, even though I had thought about entrepreneurship, I didn't actually make the move until I got fired. 
So I thought about it, but I didn't have the courage to do it until somebody else made the decision for me. Uh, it was sort of like they enabled me to make the decision because I, I had to make a decision to move in some direction. Mm -hmm. And I decided, okay, this is, this is um, the world is telling me something. This is actually when I need to take advantage of this opportunity and go for it. Yeah, and that's kind of providence. Now looking back at it, you're sort of glad that it happened because you're more happy running your own business, successful. You're you're not dependent on someone else's paycheck that's not stable. You're not always looking down the road and worrying that you're going to lose this job. I just think there's so many benefits to it. Um, I would say, and one of the things that I talk to, I, I talk about a lot within our own Facebook group and on some of our blog posts is that in today's digital age, I think it's probably easier to either start a business or work for yourself in some capacity. Uh, we meet lots of people who are retiring even that are gonna be living just on social security. And I'm telling them you have a million things you can do now to make money on your own. You can drive for Uber or Lyft, you could tutor online, you can pet sit. We've got a client that's a professional Santa Claus. He works all year long doing Santa Claus stuff, which who knew that you could do something like that. And, and so people can do it on a part-time basis, but it's easier even before retirement age than what, what people might've had even 10 or 20 years ago. Would you agree? Um, I would agree. I definitely agree. It, there was a time when it took a fair amount of capital to start a business. Nowadays, it takes really minimal amount of capital to start a business. And the, the one other piece of advice I would offer, if you're thinking about starting a business, sell first before you actually develop anything. Yeah. <laughs> because you will, you will spend time and money trying to develop something that nobody wants to buy. If you can sell it and then, and then produce it, think about the way software companies develop their software. Yeah. Right? They, they, they sell something and then they actually... And it's very minimal, and then they develop the product further. Testing the market to see if there is a market for what it exactly. is that you want to sell. Yeah, get, get one customer, then find out what what additional something you can sell to that customer. Find mm -hmm. out who they know who wants to buy what they've already bought, and just expand that way. And that will also make it easier for you to start, and it will reduce the cost for you to start. Sure. And you can test your own sales ability out as well and see if it's something that you enjoy or if it intimidates you. So there's a lot of um, good things about that advice. Are there any classes or courses or actions that someone who's in their 50s or 60s now could take today, kind of while they're still working, to better prepare themselves to start their own business in the event of an unexpected job loss? Um, there are ton tons of resources, um, many of which are free. Um, as an example, I now host two podcasts. They're both <laughs> yeah. about entrepreneurship. They are free, <laughs> right? Smashing the Plateau, we have 500 episodes out. You can wow. listen to all kinds of people talk about everything related to entrepreneurship. Many of my guests have gone from employee to entrepreneurs. They can talk about that. And now the new podcast, Going Solo, is specifically about the transition from being an employee to being an entrepreneur late in your career. And we're, we're featuring mostly stories of people who have done it, along with a few experts that advise people like that. So you can learn a lot just from resources like that. In, I'm in New York. The New York Public Library has a great um, seminar series through the, there's a great, um, uh, there, there's a business library that's devoted to business. And uh, there are free seminars that are offered um, multiple times per month. The Small Business Administration offers these kinds of things. I think in most locations, some kind of uh, public entity will be offering something on entrepreneurship. You can go online and just watch, um, you can watch videos like that. I'm sure you have plenty of stuff on your <laughs> show about entrepreneurship, right? That's also free, just go on YouTube. Yeah. Um, you don't have to even leave home. Buy yeah, books. Do that books so are easily. relatively cheap. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I was thinking about this when you were saying that. I think back when I started this business, probably in late 2004, before I left the job that I knew I would be leaving, I went um, and found the Fort Worth Small Business Administration, and I remember I booked an hour 
with what they called a navigator or something. And we just went and met with them. And, and I was very intimidated about like, should I incorporate? And how do you file that paperwork? And how do you even know what that is? How do you choose the structure of your business? I was really getting ahead of myself. And they were able to kind of say, this is actually the easy part. The part that's going to be harder is, you know, finding a location, finding your leads, learning how to sell. And I wasn't really worried about any of that because I thought I would bootstrap it. And that's exactly what I went out and did. But those other things were intimidating me. And that was a free work resource that I found. And that was 15 years ago now. So that was before it was just so easy to Google how to start a business. And I bet if you went online today and said how to start my own business or how to start a business online, you'll find hundreds of thousands of listings on Google for that. And you can read from, you know, people like yourself that have actually done it. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So what is your mission from here with the Going Solo podcast? Um, I would like to um, reduce the shame and the fear that's associated with late career job loss and let as many people know that it is definitely feasible to start a business, to create a business that's successful and to create a business that can be more successful and a lot more rewarding than your last job ever was. <laughs> yes, I think so too. I love that. David, my hat's off to you. I love your mission. I love your podcast. I think it's amazing. Tell us um, how people can find you if they want to come and listen to the podcast or even speak with you to get some coaching. I know that you have a business built around that. So how can people who might be thinking about building a business or or starting a job after a late career job loss, re, uh, reach out to you and find you. Um, they can go to our website, smashingtheplateau.com. Both podcasts can be found there. Um, and you can also, there's a contact form. You can get in touch with me. You can book time with me there. Um, I'm, if you have a question about how to go through the transition yourself or how to start a business, um, you can book a free call with me right yeah. on the website. I highly recommend that to anyone that's listening, just because I have used uh, coaches in my own career a number of times and very eye-opening things that you would never think of. And sometimes just even if it's only a couple of sessions for someone to kind of hold your hand, it might make that leap easier. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I know how busy you are with both of the podcasts, but I think our audience is going to love this. And uh, we can't wait to see how everything goes with your podcast. Be sure to keep in touch. Thanks so much, Danielle.